Testing. Awesome. Morning, everyone. I was just about to get my early riser badge, but have to speak. Hopefully, someone can grab one for me. That'd be cool. Uh, good morning, and thank you for being awake at this time, 10 a.m., which is pretty early. I think we're all maybe a bit sizzled, sizzled from last night. If you're in to, here to speak, uh, listen. It's on fishing for the shell. So, like trials and tribulations of fishing. Um, thank you for coming. So the re the reason I created this talk is I watched a video on Iron Geek on fishing and things like that, and I was like, hey, I want to learn to fish. So I did all the things, I documented it, and then thought it'd be a great opportunity for people to understand how I did it, how I learned, the mistakes I made, and maybe give some newbies or or veterans some um, insight to how other people learn, and hopefully it can help you in some way. So let's kick it off. So who am I? I'm a security consultant at KPMG. I'm also in Canada, but originally from Australia, so I have a funny accent that people love to give me crap about. Uh, the KPMG website is there. I've done some talks at B-Side Circle City Con last year, which was really great. Uh, Hackfest in Canada and Sector, and then B-Side Las Vegas. I'm just setting my timer or my stopwatch so I don't go over time. Um, I have my OSCP, I mostly focus on offensive security, I do a lot of research for purple teaming and mixing the two. To humanize me, I go to the gym, it's a bit hard when people are like, what do you do, you're like infosec, and they're like, what else, and you're like, I lift weights, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, my other talks are on SlideShare, I do have to say views are my own, do not represent the KPMG company that's like international and stuff, so, but I am very excited to say that they paid for me to come here and sponsor the talk. So as a result, they were like, awesome, we want to sponsor your talk, but it has to be all in our branding because they're an international company. They don't want any de deviations from the norm. So it's all blue. It's not as colorful as my presentation at NOLACON, but I did make some changes and all that. So the outline. We're going to go through what is phishing, phishing attacks, are real world use. We're going to go through the different types of phishing. We're going to go through something I found on Cobalt Strike X called the email minefield. We're going to learn phishing, what does it involve and what does it require, and then how I learned to fish. Uh, some frameworks, a couple of payloads, and a virtual machine that's pretty cool as well. So we get to some phishing examples because you know, phishing's real world. Uh, there's the phishing emails and phony web pages, the Nigerian scam, the lottery scams. You've seen the, all the emails and them come through and be like, yeah, this is crap from the junk folder. But I have had a relative fall to someone sending the email, you've got a virus. And then they actually called pretending to be from Microsoft and she paid them and she got scammed, which was pretty crappy. Uh, has anyone else had Fall into scam or spam or phishing? What type? It's actually internal work spam. Oh, yeah. And it was something to do with uh, an upgrade on a piece of something. Yeah. They crafted really well. Yeah. I, I would fall to phishing if there was a the right pretext and I win a million dollars, you know. I think that's it. No. <laughs> They don't take one person. So, examples of phishing, uh, Gmail, things like that. So this is just one from a university. Dear network user, inform you that your network password will expire. Please click the link and change it or to update it. Uh, there's this guy on Twitter called John RTWC. He's at Microsoft. He does the threat intelligence and reverses all the doc documents. So I got some awesome examples from him. There's uh, Excel with the Windows Network Security pop-up box. So they're not just emails, they're documents as well. They pretend to be antivirus. It's super secure document. You need to enter your Windows password again. You're not being hacked. Then there's URLs. So they can even update and manipulate the URL so that you can't see the sort of JavaScript in it. Oh, it's too bright for my clicky. Oh, well. So I've shown you some examples. Uh, some phishing engagement types. So when we do phishing as a company or, yeah, you want to do internal phishing or you do it as a job instead of an attacker, attackers go for shell and credentials. 
but there is a three of them. There's phishing for clicks, phishing for credentials, and phishing for control, command and control. And that's what I'll get into more deeply a little bit later on. So counting for clicks, right? When you do an engagement, you send the emails, 10 emails, 10 people, 10 people click, it's a click rate of 100%. It's pretty pretty basic. So it's just creating an email campaign with an enticing story, pretexting. Your your victim clicks the link, you count it, and then you have statistics and you do security awareness programs. The so links, most of my talks also have links that you can look into and research later as well. I forgot to mention that. So counting clicks, you can write PHP code. So simple, every time a user connects to your website, you you increment by one in a text file. Pretty simple. Just follow that and do it. Or, like MySpace days, you can get all the clicks. Super awesome counters if you want to use them. But there's also gathering credentials. So that's things like a fake website to copy your, open, your Office 365. Or it can be anything. So this one I saw from back home in Australia. We have a Australian MyGov site where they're trying to take everything online. And it actually requests you as your first thing to upload a passport front and back side. So that's, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty big. So then you've got your VPN, your Office 365. That's just a standard Cisco login screen that I always find in pen tests. But for phishing, you could get some users to click and then enter their password, things like that. The only, well, clicking for, uh, phishing for clicks is fine. There's not real much risk at all. But gathering credentials, it's the client gets a bit more wary because if you've got all these passwords that are apparently real, they're then going to have to reset the passwords. And then if you're storing them, are you storing them in encrypted, are they secure, are they two-factor FA, and where are they stored, what country, all these things come into it. So there's a lot more exposure one level up from clicks. And then we get to command and control. So the nice little turtle explains the shells, because shells all the way down. But there's asynchronous and synchronous shells. Does everyone here know what a shell is? Dan sort of gave a little introduction on how the shell became the the name. The synchronous, synchronous shell is like a constant tunnel. So think of an interpreter, you've got constant communication back and forward. Whereas an asynchronous shell is what APTs use. It's low and slow. So if you've played with Cobalt Strike, the trial or the full version, it's got the beacon, which you can change to be like 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and it pings back every minute, half a day, hour, things like that. It's more strategic and tactical. And then the Empire agent, as an example, PowerShell Empire, or the Python version, which they created, which is pretty cool. And then just another picture, as a hacker, you want to get through the firewall or their external perimeter, and then you get control of their boxes, which have clouds on them, because everyone's always moving to the cloud. The issues with phishing, for command and control is like any external pen test or advanced threat emulation or simulation, is that you want to make sure your own infrastructure is secure because someone might hack you and hijack control. Uh, you, you always want to do encrypted communications because there is interpreter shells which are HTTP or TCP or even Beacon as well. You want to make sure no one can read the data off the wire. And then because you're exfiltrating data out the network, it, that's more than just credentials. You want to make sure they're secure and stored and everything. So, like, I know you, your own self has to be PCI compliant. And with all our hacking tools, there's a lot of holes in them, things like that. So, there's a lot to consider. And clients really push back on this type of stuff as well. So, I just wanted to throw in a picture of the cloud because it's all going to the cloud again. And your kettle and watches and IoT devices because they're just becoming more attack vectors for everyone. So the email minefield is something I really wanted to go through when I was researching phishing and like what's the steps and security controls I have to bypass. Has anyone heard of the email minefield? No? What are some controls that you have to bypass when phishing? So like spam, antivirus, pardon? Yeah, but also when you're getting the shell, 
It's just like your pen test you have to get out of the network, firewall, IDS, and everything. So I went to Cobalt Strike website, his blog. It's like amazing. And came across this email minefield. And I think it's just a great visual way to understand and play with each step when you're practicing so that when you do the pen test or the phishing, you're more prepared and you can get the code out without it getting caught. Or if it does get caught, you can sort of understand more likely which part. So don't stress, it is a lot of information off the bat, but we're going to dig into it one by one after I have some coffee. Because it is very early. <laughs> I don't think many of us slept. So the very first thing is setting up your email, which has your which means you have to deal with your mail antivirus or the client's mail antivirus. This includes the sender policy framework, and this is just a bit where they ensure you're not spam. So if your email server requires SSL and a domain and things like that, and it's not considered spam, it's just a way to list of the authorized sending hosts for a domain to re for each domain or email server to record that yes, I know you, you can send email and you're trusted. Basically, most organizations will have this, and it's going to be hard to spoof if you're doing a fake email or trying to pretend that you're a client's email. There's a lot of things that where they'll be like, not nah, denied. If, if your, your domain doesn't actually match the real domain, you're screwed. So with that, it's actually really uh, advised that you create a fake website and domain similar to the context of your email. So whether it's a golf website, it's just the most basic thing I can think of. Just makes it more relevant instead of pretending to be like Microsoft with one in it. And then there's a Unicode and everything. So once you bypass mail and antivirus or the sender policy framework, you, there are things like sandboxing and attachment scanning. So just like your host antivirus, some things will actually rip open your payload and run it, run the code, like Sandboxy and Cuckoo might, might even be in the cloud and things like that. Um, so it actually might open the file, so you have to be really careful with that as well. And if you do want to read up on that, I've put sources and references as well, so you can play on your own. And then what is mail antivirus? So if you just go to Google and ask for a question, it sort of says what it does and Google will actually just block all executables, not even scan them, it just blocks them dead. So it's, it's nice and simple, just get scanned and blocked. So a way to buy, do this internally or test in yourself is to test with different files. So if you're using Google or your own email uh, server, executables, JavaScript's really popular with threat actors today, or was when we blocked them now. but. Chris Gates has this tool, it's a malicious file maker. It's got all these different file types, JS, PowerShell as well, because everyone loves PowerShell these days. So it's really great to send the email and see if it gets through or not, and sort of understand why and how. Since this talks about practicing, it's really great. And they pop calculator, so nothing benign. Good idea to test them. So once you get your email into someone's inbox, good job. Done, right? You're finished, because they're just going to count on clicks. No, we're not doing clicks. We're doing it for command and control. So, but wait, there's more. So the payload needs to execute and actually get out to us, or actually execute on the host. That's the very first thing. So we've bypassed the center policy framework, the mail antivirus, and you've got your mes message delivered. Awesome. Now we've got host antivirus to deal with. There's just so much more to do. So with host antivirus, I'm sure you've had your own computer, whether it be Windows XP, 7, 10, you've got your antivirus such as Avast, AVG, things that pop up and make your computer run slow because it wants to scan. Does anyone have a favorite antivirus here? Defender? Yeah. Hate all antivirus. It's not hard to bypass. Um, there's just so many out there for money, just A, B, C, D, E, F, like random, say a word, and it's probably antivirus. So some tips for running these, if you're a pen tester, you probably already know them. 
because you're doing fishing might be something new. So this is the way I think about it. It's a pen test, but you're trying to get the email through. So you want to run your payload in memory with this fileless malware <laughs> that's out these days. PowerShell's native. It's really good. There's DLL as, as well, which are really good. Removing signatures out of your tools, so such as Mimikatz, removing the word Mimikatz as well as the comments out of the PowerShell code, probably won't get flagged, or running the JavaScript version of Mimikatz, which came out months ago. So I've actually got a link in there about some uh, grepping, or I think to remove comments out of PowerShell code. It's really worth going through that. It's like mind blown type of stuff. So you get code execution, it's running. Awesome, 100%. You're done, right? No, as we said, there's even more to do. So the way I think about it is once you get the code running, it's your pen test part. You bypass the antivirus. You've now got to deal with whitelisting. Maybe you're in a constrained language mode for PowerShell. So you've gotten the box with the email that's great, but here is what I call the email privesque. <laughs> because you want to get code execution again, which is great. But then you really have to go through this red bugger here, IDS, intrusion detection, and then the firewall, and then you can get positive C2. So we've done extremely well to get this far, because you bypass the, the antivirus and the host antivirus, even though host AV doesn't really count. So intrusion detection, who's blue team here? Probably most of you. Red team or offensive? IT students in general? Oh, it's actually a good, good mix, so a bit of red and blue. But IDS has a lot of different formats. So you've got detection, which it does nothing. You've got your prevention, where it'll actually detect and then do something. So it can fail open or fail closed, it, whatever. And then there's signature-based, which is like your standard antivirus. So when the traffic goes through, oh, meterpreter is going through a network, we're going to shut it down. Or there's anomaly-based. So there's a lot of new AI technology coming out with anomaly-based where we did one workshop at KPMG or like a, a trial for some AI company, and it can take a year to understand how the network works. And then if someone does one action that they haven't done last year, it pops up an alert, and you have to say whether that's normal or not, or OK or not. And it's, it's just this new technology that's probably going to mess with us soon. Because, pardon? Yeah, user behavior analytics. It's just, is it going to pop up every time some user decides to be different or go to a different website or Chinese website or something? I don't know. So it's another thing we've got to think about for the future. So a decent company will actually have something in place. So it's definitely worth practicing and trying to get around it. So these things are not necessarily as easy to bypass. Um, they may have an intranet proxy. You might have to supply the credentials to get out. So it might go through, check that, be really manual that way. But there is obf obfuscation you can do. There's like invoke PowerShell obfuscation. Uh, there's false negatives. So a lot of attackers will do, or I think there's a FireEye box or something. One of the boxes, I don't know which, but you can send enough traffic to cover the buffer and then slide your traffic th underneath as a wait a bit and shoot it through. There's also URL encoding and all different types of encoding is example in the red so that when it goes through the network, the IDS can't pick up which website you're going to, whether it's like GitHub Mimikatz or GitHub PowerShell Empire, things like that. It's quite funny. And then more links for you to look at. SANS is pretty good as well. So for KPMG, I had to remove a Trump meme because <laughs> They didn't want that recorded in all over the world. So it's just a big firewall, but the firewall is a big bad boss at the end. You've got to figure out how to get, get out and then get your, your shell. So these can be your bastion hosts. These can be placed in a DMZ. These next gen firewalls can have deep packet inspection, just like Cuckoo or Sandbox that opens up the packets. It can re reassemble them, things like that. There's a blog with Fortinet that does a few words about evasion as well. So the evasion is fragmenting your traffic. So I guess with Nmap, you can fragment it that way, but we're trying to get the shell out, so I'll use it in a shell. You can tunnel through different protocols, such as ICMP, HTTP. Uh, you can encrypt it. HTTPS is really good if they're not doing SSL stripping or man-in-the-middling. And then firewalking is a 
reconnaissance technique. Again, similar to IDS, IPS, you can just try different ways to get around it. So once we get out of the IDS, we then have command and control. We have this beautiful love heart. You see interpreter session one opened and that meme runs. Everyone seen the meme? Where the guy's like, and gets like ecstatic about it. Oh, it's, it's so funny. But it totally feels like that. So as being a hacker, you've got your positive C2 through the sender policy framework, the antivirus, it's delivered, which is awesome, but remember you don't have code execution yet. You then have to get it to run on the host antivirus. You get code execution, which is great. You bypass, say, carbon black or whitelisting or something, and it's actually running. You've got Microsoft Cert running through .NET or something. But you still got to get it out the network, so through your IDS and firewall, and then up into the cloud, and you're good to go. So we've gone through phishing examples. I've shown you the email minefield. Did everyone understand that? Because I'm going to post them later. It has all the links. You can read them. Now we're going to go through phishing mechanics. So what does phishing actually involve? It's just sending an email and getting command and control. But it's not. I've showed you the email minefield, so it's a lot more difficult. So we have to create a domain to host an email server. We then have to send an email, and we have to deliver an email. So re registering a domain is not exactly easy the first time. When I did it, even with my, my certs and stuff, it was still a bit back and forward. So just ask people, because it's, it's just annoying. So with phishing, we have to get them to click all the things. We send an email that's pretexting, click, have to social engineering them. So there's actually user interaction in phishing. So they have to interact with it, download it, execute the malware. Have to actually execute it. That's a really important thing with getting a shell. They can't just click the link. So in summary, we need to send an email, have them press the button that says, yes, run the malware, and then it the executes and you get the code, which is awesome. So when I was doing this, I was thinking, what considerations, what do I need to learn considering I have to do these things? So a bit of social engineering, I have to build in convincing email and pretexting. I have to build a website that's convincing for them to download the actual malware because it's going to be really hard to supply it in an actual email unless you're a PDF hacker and you can do things with that. You then have to bypass the email minefield and then the really interesting bit is when someone downloads something, do they have to click it once? Do they have to click it five times? Do they have to request ITS to let them download it? So you've got to understand the payload and the user interaction from the victim side. That really differentiates you from just a skiddy or a spam that just shoots it through. So this is a bit added for this talk because I read an Ars Technica article and I was going to set up myself, but I didn't have time. But it's poor, it's so in-depth, right? So you've got your mail transfer agent. It's like a pyramid. So sending and receiving email, your MTA. You've got your MDA, your mail delivery agent, your IMAP, which our email goes into your actual inbox. Then you've got your MUA, the mail user agent, which is your email client. So on most of us with the Windows corporate uh Laptop, it'll be your Outlook. What do you guys use on Mac as the email client? Thunderbird. Thunderbird? Because I know there's like Pigeon and stuff for Linux, because I run Linux, but Mac, I haven't done it all. So when you're sending an email, for the infrastructure, you, you must have a valid SSL TLS cert because it's not going to, all the different email servers are not going to trust you. So once you send it out and it gets denied, you're screwed. So you do this in the etc. SSL private. And then you have to decide if you want virtual or real accounts. So if you're using just one user, you might just be like, oh, OK, a real account on the actual server, done, no worries. But if you've got 500 for your company, you don't want to set up 500 users that allow access to the actual machine. You want to restrict it to the actual email client. So it's like a virtual account things like that. Does anyone else work with, uh, say, IDS Help Desk uh, setting up email accounts internally? No? OK. So you, you're going to have to fight spam, depending how long your email server's up, whether it's a week or a couple of days. So it's just 
Uh, you've got to validate you're definitely real spam filtering, spam assassin, things like that, because you're not going to, if you get too much email, you're not going to know who's replying when you're phishing. So I was talking about this talk with friends on a Twitter DM, and Marley uh, actually suggested this tool called Catfish, which we all know what catfishing is, but it's domains that are extremely similar, uh, Unicode and Punicode as well, and it checks if they're available. It does this automatically, which is really cool. So to do phishing, uh, this is how I learned since we've gone through what we need to do for phishing, what I need to learn, things like that. I was like, how, where and how am I going to start since I've done all this criteria? So since we're in InfoSec, we hit up the Twitters. We hit up Google. We do the hashtag InfoSec. Who on here is on Twitter? Awesome. You should definitely always use it because there's so many cool people and they're very helpful. And just the knowledge sharing and the open source tools that you become aware of, I really recommend getting on Twitter if you're not. I think it was actually everyone, so good job. And Google. We all know what Google is, so there's no need to explain it. So the three tools I looked at, open source, and what they re recommended on Twitter was Social Engineering Toolkit, Fierce Fish, and Go Fish. Has anyone not heard of them? Exactly. They're pretty popular. So the very simple thing I did was I installed them, played around, and decided on my preferred tool. So that's what you do when you're testing and playing around. So with the different frameworks that I had, with the Go Fish, Fierce Fish, I chose on different criteria to use. So each phishing framework has to send an email because that's what you're doing, right? Like if you can't send an email, you're screwed. Has to track the email opening or pr preferred to so that if you send it to 100 people, you know that maybe one person actually opened it, which means your pretexting was wrong. If 10 people opened it, but you're not getting anything back, maybe your code's not executing. So you can sort of troubleshoot it a bit better. And then you want to clone a website and save credentials, so you want that opportunity as well. And then when you clone the website, you want to be able to uh, edit the back end for command and control, and then some graphs and result reporting, because C-levels, managers, all love those visual graphs. They're all Gen Xs, which don't add much value, but they love their pretty pretty graphs. I didn't say that. So installation. <laughs> graphs are the best, like, you know, pie charts and 3D things these days. So go fish, right? You go to the website. It says, download the binary, chmod it, run, and it works. And I'm like, what open source tool works that easily, right? Like, no way. But it says it on the website, has the password and everything, and it worked on Kali, first go. chmod plus x executable, go fish, run it, starting phishing server. I was like, oh, that, that's too easy. Like, how many tools do you download and you need like 50 million different binaries or it breaks? App get upgrade, dist upgrade, done, you're screwed. So go fish looks really clean. It's so pretty. It's just easy to use. You've got your nice dashboard, campaigns, users and groups, email templates, everything you'd expect from a phishing campaign. So in comparison, we have Fierce Fish. Nothing wrong with Fierce Fish, except that it doesn't work in Kali, which I find really strange considering most pen testers or people interested in offensive security probably learned Kali straight away. So it doesn't work for some reason. The actual uh, script will not let it run if it doesn't identify that it's in Ubuntu. So this takes a configuration script which you edit with your domain, passwords, things like that, and then at the end you click configured equals true, and you run it, and then it f finds that you're running Ubuntu because it wants you to use that, and then it installs. It installs pretty easily, just not as easy as GoFish. The one thing I did notice is that I was doing 120 uh, local host as my domain because we were playing around. And it actually gives you an external, it, it works out your external IP address and suggests that as where you go to load up the login screen. So if you're going to try Fierce Fish, use the local host login and then it will work fine. It's just these little things you fall into when you're learning. So set, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's not really a popular tool or anything. Everyone knows it? Good. 
And I was like, pretty lame joke, because it's like, everyone knows it, but yeah. So it's by Dave Kennedy. It's really amazing. It's installed in Kali by default. And then he's got this great thing of, do not use set for illegal purposes, blah, blah, blah. Do you agree with the terms? Yes. Cool. Then it's made by Dave Kennedy. The code name I had was underground at the time. I don't know if he's, up he might have updated it since then, but it's really awesome. So it's got lots of options, like a bucket load, but since we're f focusing on phishing, it's under social engineering attacks, and then under that, spear phishing attack vectors and website attack vectors. So there's no installation for it. It's really cool. <coughs> so when we have a framework and we want to do phishing, we want to send an email, oh, whoops, sorry, here we go. So the phishing framework, which out of those four, I also had a look at Cobalt Strike as well, the trial, while I was on a plane, so it was pretty fun. So they all send an email, easy, they all should send an email. So Goldfish has a nice little, again, interface, it's just a new template, this is what it looks like, and you can import an email. So if you, you want to test a client and they send a rejection email or a out of office, you can clone it, which is really awesome. Fierce Fish as well allows you to create an email and attach files, which is pretty good, standard for an email, uh, phishing tool. Cobalt Strike forces you to download an email or create your own in that code. It doesn't allow you to use HTML to create one. It's more of an advanced tool. So it expects you to do targets where you have users in the thousands or hundreds. So it takes a file for the usernames and then the template. So it's actually quite advanced. So then we get to tracking and opening the email because you want to know how many people have actually opened it and maybe read it. Fishfish doesn't have that option for some reason. Gofish does, Social Engineering Toolkit does, Cobalt Strike. I'm not too sure if it actually does have that because it imports an email. It doesn't allow you to add that image. So Gofish has it as simple as add the tracking image. You add files, things like that, nice and easy. Fishfish is actually pretty good because it gives you all these options, individual ID of the email, the status, the campaign and when it's planned to be sent. So it's really helpful that way. <coughs> but I don't think it actually lets you track the opening email. So if you're doing for shell, you might want to clone a website. Fierce Fish doesn't allow you to do that. I think it's strictly for like counting clicks, things like that. Uh, GoFish, Social Engineering Toolkit, and Cobalt Strike do. So in, as an example, in GoFish, you've got your landing page, or you can import a site, and that's where it says you can clone it. So you can design your own within GoFish, or hand code your own, then clone it. Or, or clone Microsoft.com or something. It's pretty easy. And then, of course, set with Dave Kennedy, it has this as well. It has the site cloner option or web templates, which you can build from, or a custom import as well. So Cobalt Strike's really cool as well. It has the clone, clone site. And then it will actually give you the option for a local URL so that you can name it whatever you want. Really easy to use. <coughs> And then since we do these phishing engagements for people that pay us, they want to understand the results, the graphs, the uh, percentages, and how it impacts them. So the graphs result for recording is all of them. And since Cobalt Strike's the advanced simulation tool, it's got reporting up the wazoo. It's like which indicators we used like on the actual network, the malware. It's just crazy. Who opened it? It's, it's just, yeah. <laughs> So once you uh, choose your frameworks, you've played with them, understand what they do, the benefits and uh, negatives, you want to practice, right? You want to pretend you, you're doing it live. So I was lucky enough, I was Googling around, and Cobalt Strike, Raphael Marge, again, helped us out with a virtual machine called Morning Catch. So it's really good, because it's a virtual machine that's made to practice phishing. It's got an email client. It's got some Linux client-side vulnerabilities as well, so you can hack the browser and that. Or, <coughs> But it also runs Wine, so it has some Windows tools as well. So instead of just playing Linux and hoping it works in Windows, you can actually do it in this as well. So you don't have to set up DNS or set it up in the cloud. You can just do it on your laptop. It's really awesome. And the link is there if you want to go get it. Just 
great tool. So it has a login page as well. So this is where you practice your clone websites and see how good each tool is. It's also got an email, obviously an email client, but uh, this is just an example of when I use GoFish to send it to. Like just so easy, good to practice, things like that. So it does give you a warning because it has some protection. So when you have an email and it has unexpected content, do you allow it to show remote content? It's sort of real world, but not, because I guess this is the best you can get for open source. So when you practice, you want to make your own web pages. <coughs> well, I made my own web pages. But the point here is it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't. You don't have to be a web developer, right? So HTML did the job. I put something up in the cloud, my pretty web page has a first and last name, enter your details, and then I was practicing with the uh, download boxes as well. So nice and simple. So if you want to do this, you can just do your HTML, point, I'm just showing you the, the download code with PHP or JavaScript as well. There's different things, different ways to code serving a file, which is pretty cool. So to get my machine in the cloud, I just used DigitalOcean. You could use Amazon as well. I also registered the domain with hexandflex.com. Nice and easy. The uh, funny thing is, uh, when you're doing the domain registration, I also have Poptopone as well. So this is through Rebel as well. And then I have Amazon Web Server for the other domain, just because I was testing them, having a look at prices and things like that, which you might want to do. But the funny thing is, for my DigitalOcean box, I have a have my rebel register pointing to Amazon, pointing to DigitalOcean DNS, then to DigitalOcean my website. I, I was just lazy and did it that way because it was already set up on AWS. So I just pointed it to DigitalOcean because I found it cheaper. So on that note, if you're creating a website, if you have you been trained to check for the lock, the little green icon on a phishing website, you know, users click everything. So you want SSL because if it doesn't have that lock, oh, that's another trigger that they might bail and not click your payload or your phishing campaign might not work. So on DigitalOcean, they have lots of tutorials. It's actually really awesome, like anything, creating a user, SSH login uh, with a password or with uh, a key, things like that. So go there because it's, it took me like five minutes, right? It's so easy. You create a demo user or just a secondary user with, that's not root. Then you give them so, pseudo access. You download Let's, Let's Encrypt and install Python. You run the ad domain and allow the domain through SSL and your SSL encrypted, like literally. So here is proof. So it's not, not secure. Started with a non SSL website. I pseudo at, get it a few things, just a repository, then you install the Python cert bot Apache, uh, then you run it. So I'm using Apache, the domain is uh, hexandflex.com, and it worked. The only thing is that I had used uh, the UFW firewall and only allowed AD and SSH, and it's not installing. I'm like, what the hell, what is wrong? And then I checked the status, and 443 is not open, so it's trying to install, it's not open, it can't reach out. So make sure you allow it through your firewall, because that's a really big noob mistake, which I happen to do a lot. <laughs> so it's great learning. And then from that, you're now secure, you've got the little green lock in the icon, you're super secure, you're not a hacker or anything. <laughs> so, on my DigitalOcean machine, I had the website set up, I had all the files created, so it's just playing around. So you've got your, your action.php to download things, your download.php with different, different code, different way to download files. It's just testing. So you just play it up in the cloud. Um, yeah, and your payloads are up there, your HTA files and things like that. So we have the DigitalOcean machine, the morning catch machine to practice on really good. So what do we do now? We've got to send emails. But what's a real attacker do? They understand the user interaction. So when someone clicks a link or runs code, what do they see? Do the machine slow down? What alerts do they get? Things like that. So I wanted to show the way I was practicing. I think I've got like 10 minutes, yeah. yeah. So HTA files and click once and DLL is what I wanted to show. 
So a HTA file is really cool. It's just a HTML application, literally. The easy way to create one is through PowerShell Empire. It's open source. Generate it, set it to a listener, create a file. So I just did test.hta because whatever, we're just practicing. You execute and run it. And then Enigma has a great phishing tutorial with Empire, which is really awesome. So the cool thing here is that when you open it, the HTA file actually has the uh, the code. It's just HTML in. It's just a PowerShell command to pull down a file and execute it in a HTA file, which is really cool. And then at the end, it used wscript.shell.run, and then it's meant to hide the PowerShell file. But there's a reason I highlighted that. So for me, testing it was just oh look, testing HTA with a download button. So here I used the header, location slash test HTA, nice and simple. But what happens with the user, or this is on Windows 10, Internet Explorer, standard settings, like a new install. You have to click open, so that's one step. The user has to click open or run. And then number two is that a website wants to open web content and run. So then step two, you have to click allow, right? That's not too much. But the user interaction three is that PowerShell actually pops up the command prompt for a second. Now, if you remember back here, it's hidden. And if you ran that and tried to fish someone, you didn't test it, you wouldn't actually know that they do get a quick pop-up. So it's just like training your trade craft and learning. It's really important to practice. I just can't emphasize it enough. But you do receive your cell after that. So it's just simple three interactions, the client's probably going to be really suspicious. So then we're going to try a DLL. So again, we're going to use PowerShell Empire. We're going to create it, test DLL, upload it in the cloud with the header again. Nice and simple. But what does the user see when it's a DLL file? So you've got to save the file. Internet Explorer, this is standard. So uh, DLL files are like code, and they have an entry point, and you can use uh, command line to run them, so they actually require user interaction. So I was trying all the different things for PowerShell Empire and couldn't figure it out. I think the Cobalt Strike one is main or run by something simple. But I could not figure this one out. So I researched a bit and I was trying to test if it was the DLL being created by PowerShell Empire or I was just using the wrong entry point. So I was trying to test it and it still wouldn't work. So when you're practicing things, you run into errors you can troubleshoot. But if you're doing it live, <laughs> you're screwed. Your, your manager's going to be like, well, that failed. Let's tell the client we can't fish them, when that's not really the case. So you really have to practice. And I've got PowerShell Empire Link and Sixstub, amazing researcher. I think he's at Microsoft now, or that might be sub -t, But anyhow, it's really good to practice and run into errors to make you a better hacker, or pen tester, or fisher. Or even if you're blue team, learning this stuff will really help you as well. So the last five minutes, I wanted to show you this awesome thing that I watched in the video. It's called Click Once. It's by Microsoft. So it's created as to help you blue teamers deploy patches and updates across the network. So you have to create it in a specific way in Visual Studio, sign it through Visual Studio, upload it to a certain path, and then use Internet Explorer as well. So it's a bit, it's a bit clunky in setting it up because I had trouble actually running it. So on DigitalOcean, you have to use the COA slash application files, and then you have to have all of the files that are created from Visual Studio in there as well, and it's like five or six. It's really clunky to set up, but it's really awesome because it's meant to be this click once. You click update and it runs. You don't have to jump through all these user interactions of downloading, allowing access. Are you sure? Yes, click again. Does anyone remember Vista? Security updates or that pop up every two seconds. It's amazing. It's so annoying. So here it is just uploaded. It's probably good for the visual learners. Uh, application files and just set up.exe in a COA folder. So I wanted to use JavaScript because let's try something else. So I was using window.open, which loads it up from the main page. So what happens is that you get a pop-up saying, do you want to open the application? So you click open, right? 
Oh, I'm missing a file, but there's also will you enable this uh, through Internet Explorer. And then the third pop-up is actually the one click once where you click run. So there's actually three user interactions. So much for a click once, right? So if you set this up, you didn't practice, and you're not getting any shells, you're like, what the hell? You have no idea. So the issue with this is when using JavaScript, there's too many things for the user to click, and they're going to become suspicious and maybe alert ITS and things like that. So we, I use PHP with this. So I use the action download.php, so it links to another web page, and then lets you download the file. So it's just uh, the red box and using action. So then here on my website, just the update is just to that page, nice and simple. And then it's just a PHP header to the, to the application to download and run. So this time, there's only one user interaction, and it's just to allow it and run it. Simple. Oh, cool, ITS has given me this link to update and patch. Oh, no security warnings, done. Run it, nice and easy. And then you get calc.exe. But, well, not but, I realized that uh, with these, I might have needed to test on a separate box because I've already whitelisted the machine. So I've got to go back and double check for my own learning to ensure that it's not just that I already clicked the whitelist the, the IP address. So while PHP works, I just have to check that. So that's the whole idea of back and forwards. So then you get your calc exe, which is awesome, or your shell, whatever you want. So I've shown you uh, what phishing is, why it's real world, some phishing examples. Uh, phishing frameworks, go fish, fish, fish are really good, and some of the different payloads, and then how I practiced. So the key takeaways with that is that always consider user interaction. If you're a pen tester or, or just phishing, always consider what the user is going to see and do, because they're your victim. And then consider the technology to bypass with the email minefield, because a lot of people just think phishing is clicks or credentials. It's, it's a totally different world when you dig in to get the shell. And then as practice is practice, things are not going to work. If you follow a tutorial, it never works. Exact steps doesn't work for some reason. So try it out and test. And then think, think outside the square. So at the JavaScript and PHP, just try different things. What are other ways to serve files? And uh, that's it. Hopefully you guys learned something. And we'll try it at home. So thank you very much. Thank you. You've got a question? I have to give you the microphone for the recording. Uh, um, on the uh, setting up the domain in that, yeah. I've noticed if you don't have a PTR record, some email servers will reject the emails or oh, accept awesome. It. Thank you. Yeah, because that uh, has a technical one is a, a really in-depth email server creation, so it's secure and everything, so I'm hoping it goes through that. Like, I read through it quite well, but yeah, that really helps. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone.